Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Gears. My name is Grayson Harris, that's with me, Cowell, and I say everybody, like literally everyone in the world is watching the show right now. All right. No You're pressure. on the clock. You're on the clock. All right. Well, there is pressure on the West Coast, though. We'll go ahead and get straight into that. There's been plenty of drama with West Coast ports dating back to, I don't know, I don't know like the middle of last year, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and my favorite part of all of this drama is that it is exceedingly petty. Um, not necessarily the, not necessarily the, you know, the root causes of the problem. I mean, of course, you know, labor disputes are never, uh, you know, they're, they're serious things. They need to be taken seriously, but it is hilarious the way that they're going about basically quiet striking, which I, which I, um, as someone who's very passive aggressive, I'm all for this. So, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I get it. Trust me. All right. So here's the backstory on this one. So at least five ports in California and Washington uh, experienced issues last Friday. Uh, so as our uh, terminal jobs went unfilled, so basically the union members just mm -hmm. didn't show up. Um, in some cases, terminal operations were just completely shut down, and in others, the gates were open, but the internal operations were closed, which you know obviously going to lead. To congestion and uh, cancel truck appointments, but you know, in most cases, though, the, the you know the problem seemed to be just you know workers weren't showing up. That yeah. was, that's what led to all the congestions. Uh, the most significant of the disruptions was in the port of Oakland, uh, and if you'll remember, the port of Oakland, we talked about them like a month or two ago, somewhere around there. And uh, these are the guys who uh, coordinated their lunches so that they all took lunch at the same time, <laughs> and uh, you know. Basically, they couldn't get loaded or unloaded, and um, petty, petty. yeah, and then the union was like, <laughs> "I don't know, they're just taking lunch, man." They, no one said that they. Well, couldn't. everybody's legally allotted their lunch. Exactly. So no one said sure. they couldn't all take it at the same time, right? Um, so the union themselves didn't take credit for it, but what they did do is, you know, take the opportunity to point out that uh, the workers are unhappy. So. Right. They basically said, uh, but we had nothing to do with it, but the, you know, the labor is unhappy, so do it that way, what you will, wink, wink. Um, so the affected ports overall uh, of this last little debacle was the uh, port of LA, port of mm -hmm. Long Beach, uh, port of, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce, Hune, Hune? Hune? <laughs> <laughs> this one right here that I'm just gonna spell out. Um, the Port of Oakland, as I just said earlier, the Port of Seattle and the Port of Tacoma. Retail Industry Leaders Association, uh, they urged, as you would imagine, a very quick resolution to this. Mm -hmm. uh, and their quote on this was, any interruption or disruption in their operations immediately has a ripple effect that impedes retailers' ability to quickly and efficiently deliver for American consumers. That is just fancy, blibby, blabby for um, there's delays and that sucks. Uh, even if the terminals are open and the workers are there, that's still going to, you know, obviously slow things down. Mm -hmm. um, now, the Employers Association, you know, basically the people who run all the ports and stuff, they obviously placed blame on the unions for staging these disruptions. And this, again, is how I love how petty they are. Uh, the unions did not take credit for the work stoppage, however. They did make sure to mention that union members were not pleased with the economic package that they were offered by uh, terminal employers during their contract talks. Um, you know, like I said earlier, the union didn't take credit for that, uh, that lunch walkout from a few <laughs> months ago, but they did take the opportunity to highlight that the members were unhappy. So they're not taking credit, but they are, they are supporting it, you know, you know, in yeah. a way. So I think they're telling us that it's them without telling us it's them. You know, as much as I love the pettiness of it, this actually is going to affect the supply chain in fairly oh, significant time. ways. Uh, you know, the West Coast ports, you know, up until last year, at least. Um, was really the hub of exporting and, and importing for the U.S. And so taking that away is obviously going to hamper um, a lot of the market there. So we'll have to see exactly how much it does. But uh, you would imagine, especially out on the West Coast, there's going to be quite a bit of, um, well, not a lot of freight. That's basically the way to put it. It's just stuck on ships somewhere. So that's what's going on over on the West Coast there. Um, I don't know, Lydia, I feel like you're also a fan of the pettiness here. I mean, do you? I mean, everybody loves a little bit of petty drama. I mean, duh. But I will say the aftermath of this oh, yeah. is going to be substantial. You know, there, there comes a time and a place where it is no longer just 
petty drama or, you know, making a stance to where you, where you kind of start seeing the magnitude of the problem and the response and mm -hmm. how those are starting to collide together. And I think that we are seeing this now. Mm -hmm. um, I think the lunch was the tip of the iceberg. That was the roundabout sort of way of we're going to bring this to your attention. And I don't think this is the last like passive aggressive, but actually just aggressive act that we are going it to It might see. get more aggressive is what I'm getting out of this. Right. That's... And so, you know, while I do applaud the creativity Absolutely. <laughs> behind the organization of these efforts, um, I do think that it is something that we should be taking pretty seriously and being prepared for the repercussions um, if things go the way that we want them to and if they do not. We'll have to see how that one goes. We'll keep you updated on it. I'm sure there will be plenty uh, to report in the future there. So hopefully it stays in at least a somewhat whimsical, petty uh, area. Uh, hopefully it doesn't escalate to anything worse, but kind of feel like it probably will. Time so, will tell. Time will tell. Very soon. Well, Whitney, what you got for us over here? You were teasing me earlier well, that you had a- we're still in the West. We're we still, are. Yeah, we're in Texas. That's mid, Midwest. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, west we're in Chattanooga here. right yeah, now, west so that's pretty here. far west for us. West of here, absolutely. Um, and we are talking about the seasonal fruit of watermelons. Watermelon. So Texas is, um, not, I wouldn't, wouldn't say they're known for their watermelons, but they are a major producer of watermelons, um, specifically the Rio Grande area, mm -hmm. that valley. Um, there are acres and acres and acres of watermelons. So what we're seeing last year, the watermelon production dipped about 17%. This is predicted to be a very average season, but we are seeing some major impacts from the severe weather that we had tail end of last year, beginning of this year out in Texas, um, showing up in our watermelon production. So while we will have a very standard volume mm -hmm. of watermelons, you may notice that your fruits this year are not as sweet. So they're, uh, they are showing a lower BRICS measurement. BRICS is how they measure, or it's the measurement of sugar within a type of fruit. Oh, I thought you meant like... BRICS. Okay. The reason we're seeing that is there was the lower quality watermelons is how okay. they're classifying this, um, was largely due to the rain. Um, there was also in different areas of Texas, there was drought, there was hail, there was windstorms. Um, the windstorms specifically impacted the pollination. Um, normally, but like I said, the volume is going to be very similar. Normally we see between 40 and 50,000 pounds of watermelons per acre, which is insane. Um, and that is right on track. So the report that I was reading for Texas agriculture is that this season is remarkably average. <laughs> Yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I understand. Are we running out of watermelons or do they just No, taste we're bland doing now? fine. They're just this season, they're not going to be as sweet as they have been in the past. Man, it's going to be a remarkably too. average watermelon for a remarkably average year. Well, that's unfortunate. But at least now you know. Remarkably average. Remarkably average. Brought to you by Shifting Gears. <laughs> uh, Wendy, you ready to put your tinfoil hat on? Yes, I am. Yes. Because boy, do I have a doozy for you. Let's hear it. Former intelligence officer says that the U.S. has recovered a craft of non-human origin. So, who is this intelligence officer, huh? Well, he is an Air Force veteran and former member of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency named David Grush. All okay. right. So he's, he's not some random kook from the backwoods. No, he's a he's a random kook from the government. Great. Mm -hmm. um, Strong starting point. All right, so he has alleged in a series of interviews that the U.S. government has secretly recovered alien spacecraft and, this is the real kicker, even dead pilots inside them. So, recovered an alien. And this has happened for decades. Wait, dead pilots, human pilots, or dead, oh, dead aliens. alien pilots? I like that we're still calling them pilots. <laughs> <laughs> Are we sure yeah, about well, that? A good captain. Hierarchy? <laughs> a good captain always goes down with a ship. Uh, so apparently this um, cover-up has been going on for decades as a part of a top-secret UFO retrieval program. Um, Grush filed a whistleblower complaint stating that he already gave classified proof to Congress and that the government was excluding Grush and the rest of the, now this is a weird way to put it, the unidentified aerial phenomena, that's what they're calling UFOs now, UAPs, just because UFOs sounded too 
Kooky, so they changed the name basically. To UF what? Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Is that the Real. better option? Was this our upgrade? I don't know. The government likes to add more syllables to things and act like it's more important. So anyway. Okay. The UAP task force, according to Grush, was kept from being able to access their program due to Congress just shutting them down. Mm -hmm. uh, so Grush told um, reporters that the retrieved objects are of, quote, exotic origin, which basically just means non-human intelligence, whether extraterrestrial or unknown origin. I feel like unknown origin. Where do you think it came from? Like the core of the earth? I don't know. Based on, I wouldn't see that alien. Yeah. <laughs> they deduced that they were of exotic origin based on the vehicle morphologies and the material science testing and also the possession of a unique atomic arrangement and radiological signatures. So we're, 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 getting, we're getting interesting here, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> he claims that the government was also able to retrieve dead aliens from inside the crash ship for uh, dissection and science experiments and all that, all that fun stuff. It's not just him saying this, okay? This, uh, his account was corroborated by, and this, this is a real full circle moment for us. His account was corroborated by Christopher Mellon, who served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. So this is, um, this is a guy who's been pretty high up in the, uh, in, in the government food chain. Um, so Mellon told reporters that a number of well-placed current and former officials have shared detailed information with me regarding this alleged program, including insights into the history, governing documents, and the location where a craft was allegedly abandoned, abandoned and recovered. According to the report, Grush, who left the government earlier this year, which is why he's coming out now, he's not in the government anymore, okay. still remains well-supported within intelligence circles and numerous sources have vouched for his credibility, all right? So... We're feeling decent about his story, at least. At least that we believe that he believes it, right? I mean, it's so far so good, I don't at least question in that regard. what his reality is. Yeah, sure. absolutely. So why now, though? Why is he just now coming out? Well, he says that he's trying to prepare the public for an unexpected non-human intelligence contact scenario, so an alien invasion. Uh, he also said that this is a global phenomenon, and yet a global solution continues to elude us. But let's pause for a moment to point out that this is all unbelievably far-fetched. And I actually do want to believe that's true. And I just can't. Okay, and, let, and let's, let's go through the reasons why. Okay, let's hear them. Okay. If aliens had the advanced technology to visit Earth, okay, presumably from another star system, we're not assuming that they are just coming from one of our moons and our solar systems, okay? Okay. Wouldn't they also have the tech to be piloted Autonomously, I even send an actual person in it. That doesn't really make any sense. Curiosity killed the alien. You absolutely, know the absolutely. And why, why would these incredibly advanced beings that are able to travel through space and time in the universe and all this other good stuff crash once they get to Earth? I mean, did they get to Earth and just become interstellar drunk drivers? It doesn't really. Oh, gravity is different here. You think they would have accounted for that if they can travel across galaxies, though, is my point. Well, do you know the gravitational pulls of all the planets? Relatively, yeah. The bigger ones have <laughs> okay, more. Okay, well. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so and, and, but here's the real thing, okay? That's just me being a hater. This one is, is real. Third and final? Maybe not. Okay. He doesn't have any physical evidence. Doesn't he, didn't he say he had a dead alien? He said the government does, not him. Uh oh. He says that he knows about all of these things and that he's been in the room with all of these things. He has no photos, no videos, no well, parts of a crash Well, he probably wasn't allowed ship. to take that kind of material with him after leaving the government. And I'm sure that he's signed substantial paperwork, which makes me question why we're talking about this now. Mm -hmm. I'm um, sure when you leave, they're not just like, share what you know. But the point I'm is, sure the point is he's asking us to believe something that is inherently unbelievable and he's giving us no physical proof of it so that alone is is questionable to me. well this this alien life controversy and topic has been around for decades yeah. that this is not new um i just feel like every seven to nine years somebody surfaces with some new bit mm -hmm. of information or a different type of claim along the same like highway. I mean, to your point, he's not the first whistleblower to come out and be the be the boy who cried alien. Um, but yet, none of them have been able to provide any sort of physical evidence that proves beyond a reasonable doubt. 
I'm wondering nice. if this has something to do. So the World Trade Forum recently met mm -hmm. and released some sort of. So they're running tests about this like global cyber attack that they foresee coming, and they're yeah. running these programs of how we would handle that. Mm -hmm. I will say, the Global Trade Forum did the same thing about a pandemic in 2019 and then oh, I do remember look this. what happened yeah. in 2020 so i'm just kind of wondering if maybe these two mm -hmm. things could potentially be related because mm -hmm. we have social media and the internet and the access that we have information to is just a very large uncontrolled social experiment on the world mm -hmm. and it's the one of the largest ones we've ever seen in history so i'm just wondering if like maybe these two things are related that something you know might be coming along the lines that we're that might like alter our everyday life or mm -hmm. our everyday knowledge yeah and, and to be fair i mean the government has authorized you know, releasing footage of what they're basically admitting are unidentified flying objects they're not saying these are aliens they're saying listen we saw this weird tic tac looking thing flying over the ocean here's here's a video of it it happened like 20 years ago but you know it's declassified now and the theory i heard on that is that they're slowly trying to introduce the idea that we've already known about this for a very long time because if they just drop it on us one day i can't even there's so many things that would we've seen the movies exactly we, we know what would happen exactly so they're i think they're just trying to do a slow leak situation where you know you know if the government puts out this video and says we don't know what this is that's actually a pretty big step i would say um, and I don't know if that's them trying to smoke screen us away somewhere else, or if they're legitimately like, this is like a, a campaign to release stuff over decades mm -hmm. until it comes out I naturally. I can't help but wonder, is this technology from another country? We can reverse engineer it. That's the whole point is that he's, he's claiming that countries and like military agencies have been basically contracting uh, with each other to take this alien spacecraft stuff and reverse engineer it into and we trust other things. That. Well, I'll be, I'll just be real with you. I mean, you know, I'm not going to act like I'm smart enough or good enough to be in the government, but I'm also not going to smart or act like anybody in the government is smarter or better than me True. because that's just, you know, I've been proven that time and time again. So that being said, it's nearly impossible for me to believe that the government can keep a secret this big hidden for decades literally decades possibly I mean, a century the secrets that we've seen about people that are in the government you know yeah, keeping, that come to light i mean in the age of information people dig keeping that information confidential through multiple generations as well and not even just that it's not just the u.s government okay because grush is claiming that multiple governments right. around the world know about it and are in on it and are competing with each other which makes it even more unbelievable that an international the international governments with varying agendas who may or may not like each other yes could history tells us do not always get along when they do there usually is one or two that get a little yeah. power hungry and then it gets mm -hmm. sideways and to think that they could all coordinate for decades to keep the entire earth from the truth is, amongst war breaking is, out um, across the world at various times that is probably my number one like point to there may not actually be anything because there, some country would have used it against another one, or there would have been some actual leak with legitimate information. I think for a century. I so mean, this is not one of those spy balloons, folks. Oh man, I think that there might be. I think with anything, there's some truth to it, and there's some falsehood to it. I think the best thing that we could. I think best case scenario, fifteen percent of what he's saying is true, and that fifteen percent probably isn't all that exciting. Like it might just be like a meteor from another star system that they can't identify so they're like well this is technically non-human and we found some bacteria on it so that's you know is so he's bacteria like the the, alien pilot? exact that's what i'm saying is he's embellishing it being like oh yeah this this uh, mitochondria was just zooming through the uh, zooming through space it's zooming mitochondria it's, it's the powerhouse of <laughs> the powerhouse do. of the galaxy so <laughs> but yeah that's that's um that's today in tinfoil hat um, I personally would like to believe that it's true, but I also know that keeping a help, healthy bit of skepticism in the world of the internet is important. So. Yes. But it's entertaining though. I hope you guys enjoyed that.
go look it up. It's fun. Yeah, take a slice yeah. of watermelon with you while you're at it. <laughs> um, so we have to bring it back to at least something transportation related to, to close it out. Okay. So um, about a month or two ago, we did a, a segment talking about some of the strangest things that truckers have seen while they're out on the road. Yes, the goat. The, yes, exactly, the goat that was strapped up. So <laughs> we have uh, the sequel to it, which is, what are some of the strangest things that truckers have hauled? Like, what exactly is in that giant trailer? So I've broken this down into three different categories, okay? okay? Category number one, water are you doing? Like water, what are you doing? What are you doing? Story number one. I went to pick up water in Gary, Indiana from a company. I went down to their Chattanooga plant and delivered the water and then they reloaded me with the exact same water bottle and water type. It wasn't like a flavored water or a different bottle size. The company just sent me back to Gary, Indiana with pretty much the exact same load that I had just delivered. Next water story. There's more water. There's three water stories. Oh, okay. Took a single pallet of bottled water out to Aberdeen, Washington on my way down I-5. I asked the store when I got there and they're like, no, nah, we don't need any more bottled water. So it wasn't even a desperate thing. <laughs> he drove with a single case. <laughs> in a 53 foot trailer too. He didn't even, he couldn't technically, he couldn't put it in the passenger seat. He had to strap it down uh, in the middle of the, in the middle of the van there, which kind of leads into this one. One time I hauled a single pallet with literally three milk cartons on it. That was the whole load. I only had to go an hour down the road too. I could have taken that in my Honda Civic. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and save on gas. Absolutely. Yeah, that's diesel too. All right, so that was what are you doing, okay? Second category, there's two stories in this category. Road overkill. Oh dear. So once delivered a, a ton, 2,000 pounds, mm -hmm. of skinned bobcat to a trapping shop it was in individual white buckets with dry ice, basically covering the majority of it. So they probably looked like a creepy science experiment. The pallet tipped and many of the crates busted open and went all over my trailer. The guy that taking the delivery didn't seem to care. Probably seen a lot of that. He picked them all up barehanded and threw them back into the buckets. That's more of a man than me. Let me tell you. Ew. That's I hope that they were preserved do, properly do because you know if how, not that this delivery unloader guy do you know the crap that he's seen it has to be horrendous i feel so horrible uh, i just feel That's horrible for that guy Two thousand pounds of skinned bobcat so that's why were they skinned for bobcat meat probably like i don't know i'm not in the bobcat meat market i don't so like I, that they did half the process if it's for the meat that's well, the good. first part yeah. And then they're like, here, it still mm -hmm. has tea. Well, there's more than one way to skin a bobcat. And that guy has probably seen it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I once had a load of sea cucumbers just piled in wooden crates, Gross. not refrigerated, and the trailer stunk afterwards. I bet it did. Ew. I asked the customer what it was for, and apparently they'd ground them into powder and, and turn them into nutritional supplements, which I would imagine also smell horrible. Oh. <sighs> You yeah. know, those have to be in a capsule because mm -hmm. nobody would open mm -hmm. that and take that. This is the last category. Okay. It's called, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Okay. <laughs> Nothing ominous about that. All right. So one time I was delivering to a remote facility in West Alabama. I was followed by government vehicles and told not to stop during the entire trip. Mm -hmm. I was also not allowed to be on site during delivery. Thought this was odd considering dispatch told me I was hauling empty canoes to a sporting goods store. They turned out to be engine-powered missile tubes. <laughs> That's a really big lie. Oh my god! Imagine he gets pulled over by DOT or something, and like, I mean, obviously they're he, just canoes. <laughs> yeah, it's like don't worry about it. They're just canoes. Pops the trailer, and he's just like, "Sir, you're so under arrest." <laughs> All right, next door here. <clears throat> I can't say when or where, but which is already a good way to start this. I can't say mystery. when or where. A Florida man. Not allowed to say when or where. But I delivered one pallet with the uh, with a weight of 55 pounds. This is a 53 foot dry van trailer. It was a small piece of furniture for an office. The weirdest part of it is that the drop is in the middle of nowhere, like tens of miles from anything else. When I went in, did all the checks, security searches and such, they happened to mention that they had a guy posted all night watching my truck through a sniper scope. 
It was 10 miles from the place that I slept at the security gate. Right? Also, it was the type of place that required an extensive background that takes several weeks ahead of time. So whatever this piece of furniture was, it must have been extremely Is he important. delivering to Area 51? Are we trying all of our stories? He can't say him? where, so... He's, he said he, like, he's not allowed to say For a piece of there. furniture? For I a feel piece like of office furniture. that fur furniture was like the it, canoe. It was an empty canoe. Yeah, for sure. This is the missile that goes in the tubes, actually. Yeah. This one. This one's sketch. All right. Look, compared to the last one? Ske sketch. There's a difference between government sketch and, and Chicago sketch. Yes. Amen, sister. <laughs> Preach, sis. I picked up a load in Laredo, Texas, which is right on the border of Mexico. Uh -huh. Took it to Chicago. Bills just said Mexican crafts. Sure. sure. I get to Chicago and wind up in a pretty sketchy little neighborhood. The place I went to was just a little corner store. No loading dock or even a driveway. Once I pull in, I open up the trailer and it's full of pinatas. Drug mule. You're, you're ahead of it, but yes. <laughs> pinatas full of what? Yeah. <laughs> I had just dragged this trailer from the Mexican border to a sketchy neighborhood in Chicago, and it's just full top to bottom, front to back with pinatas stacked on top of each other. Honestly, house. though, how funny was that view? Hilarious. <laughs> so, like... Hilarious. It would have, it, dude, it, just a flash of color as soon as you open up the trailer. Also, keep in mind, this was not a party store that he was this delivering just to, a just a corner store, store. not a place market. that could even conceivably sell pinatas. Or probably have enough space for that many mm -hmm, pinatas. Mm -hmm. So the guy tells me, hey man, it's probably going to take a while to unload. There's a restaurant a little down the block and we won't mind if you just go down there and chill while we unload. I look at him. I look at the pinatas. I look at the neighborhood. I look back at him. And then back at the pinatas. And that's when I decided the restaurant would be a good place for me to sit back and enjoy a meal while the DEA just raided the store that I called them for. Drug mule. Drug mule. <laughs> I just love the idea of this guy, after all that, just sitting at this little diner. And he's got his, he's got his coffee and his breakfast or whatever. And in the back, you hear sirens pulling up and he's just sipping on his coffee. Like, you just see pinatas being passed. <laughs> Got another one. Did it have pictures? What kind of pinatas? No, were they? you know, oh. these, none of these came with pictures or anything like that, which is super unfortunate. These are all just, um, these are actually all just truckers that answered a question on Reddit. I should have brought the pinata in here for a festive touch. Ah, yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, not quite the same pinatas though, I would imagine. No. Um, but yeah, that's craziest things that truckers have uh, had to haul. So next time you see a full 53 foot big old dry van driving next to you, it could be a milk carton or <laughs> so my favorite one. Or tons of drugs. Who's to and say? who you won't know till you open the seal. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll be seeing y'all next week with even more uh, well, freight news and uh, other news. Et cetera. Apparently. Et cetera. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys for joining us, and we'll catch you next week. Bye.